Signore e signore, buonasera, benvenuti alla Casa Italiana Azzarilli Marimò della New York University. Uh, my name is Stefano Bertini, I'm the director. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all here tonight for the beginning of a new series conceived by my colleague Alison Cornish. The series in, is entitled Dante and, and that's a very open end. Um, and Professor Cornish is going to tell you something more about the philosophy of this series, what's behind it. But I think that in both our intentions, there was the idea of presenting Dante in ways that is not normally discussed, especially in academic circles, uh, where there's a lot to be said about Dante yesterday night. Here we had a presentation of a book that is a collection of essays on Dante's political text, The Monarchia, uh, very, very prominent scholars. But what we are interested in is in the appeal that Dante still has today for everybody. Uh, young, old, Italians, non-Italian, people that have never heard of him and uh, people that know quite a bit about him. So uh, this fascination that both uh, Professor Cornish and I have for this uh, incredible charm that these 700-year-old guy from Florence still exercises on so many people all over the world will be the center of this exploration. And we hope you will be with us in this uh, exploration of all the different end that will open up with the different speakers that Professor Cornish is going to invite. Um, you, you're lucky because uh, the Casa Italiana website is down, so I don't have the bio, official bio of Professor Cornish to read to you, but she's a, a full professor of Italian studies here in our department uh, with a specialty uh, in medieval and renaissance studies. Uh, her, her area of expertise, of course, is Dante, and she uh, focused in particular in her publications in the relationship between Dante and science in its multifaceted aspects. So without further ado, I would like to ask you to welcome Professor Alison Cornish. Hey, good evening. Buonasera. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, uh, last night in the same theater, as uh, Stefano was saying, we had a presentation of a new book by my colleague, um, Maria Luisa Ardizzone, which contains proceedings from the first iteration of the Global Dante Project of New York, which she has been doing for the, we're going to have the fifth, she's going to have the fifth, uh, April 5th, uh, right here, well, here and also at Columbia. It's divided between the two places. And this year, the theme is the rime, or uh, Dante's lyric poetry. And, and then, in addition to tonight's event, there'll be another Dante talk a week from now, uh, so a week from today, next Wednesday, um, uh, also in this theater. Um, this fall, I taught div uh, Dante's Divine Comedy in this theater, and it was full. And my colleague, Maria Luisa Artizone, is teaching it this semester, and it's full. So um, there seems to be a large, maybe an endless audience for uh, Dante in tutte le salse, or in all sauces, as I like to say, in many forms. And the form that tonight's event is part of is something that I thought up together with uh, Stefano Albertini um, and um, to propose an ongoing lecture series with this um, quasi-palindrome title of Dante and. And um, the idea is the relevance of Dante um, that most universal of poets to pretty much every aspect of human interest and concern. And it seems to me that there's no better place to find a large concentration of people, not simply for whom Dante matters, as we could probably find a lot of those on the Italian peninsula, but for whom Dante is not a given, it's not a requirement, it's not something they necessarily even thought they should know, but that they discovered. Um, Stefano Albertini, Ron Hertzman, and I share this conviction very strongly, I think, uh, that Dante is worth discovering in all contexts, by all sorts of people, in all sorts of times and places. Dante is a singular genius, yes, surely like Shakespeare, of whom T.S. Eliot said they divide the world between them. He has a window on his own time, yes, but because of his unparalleled absorption of every cultural tradition to which he had access, 
He is a window on human things, broadly speaking. And because of that broad vision and grounded experience, um, he is an interpreter and critic, I would say, of our time as well as his. The first person I thought of in this new series, Dante and, was Ron Hertzman, the reason for which will become clear to you as I delve a little bit into his very long CV and when you hear his talk for yourself. But unlike uh, speaker number two, who's coming next week, Ambrogio Camozzi Bistoia, who's coming down from Harvard and gave me the title Dante and Satire, Professor Hertzman had his own title, as you see here. Um, uh, but it's precisely what I had in mind, which is Dante for everyone, uh, Dante without footnotes. Now, that's quite a feat, because we all read Dante with footnotes. Professor Hertzman does, too, um, even if we don't like footnotes, um, although end notes are worse than footnotes. <laughs> um, you, won't, you won't venture far, into, even into the inferno where the gate is wide, without you know, running to your footnotes pretty quickly, or your commentary, or your digital Dante, or your Dante worlds, or your just general Googling, which I don't recommend, but at least efficient way to go about this. But I would say that Dante wouldn't see this as a defect. In, in, in his time, all important books came with footnotes, um, or as he would call them, a commentary great philosophers and writers wrote commentaries. That's probably why Dante wrote his own commentary on his own works so that you would see that he was important, right? To had a commentary. And his own sons started to write commentaries on the Divine Comedy, so they knew what dad wanted, you know? Commentary, which means footnotes. Um, and recent translators of Dante, some have tried um, to make the translation such that you don't need footnotes. And they have to stretch and twist a lot of things and kind of over-determine the text in ways that I would say limit it. So I wouldn't advise that route as well. And I would also say that Italians don't read Dante without footnotes. In fact, much of what is in the footnotes in Italian editions is actually paraphrase, uh, that, which is to say translation of the original archaic, uh, uh, which is now archaic uh, Italian, um, poetic and beautiful Italian into uh, some kind of workable functional paraphrase in modern um, updated Italian. So real Italians have confessed to me that they too use the English side of the facing page translations we use in our Dante classes in America because it helps. For Dante, all texts, at least important ones, required a commentary because they demanded those important texts like the Bible, like Aristotle, um, like Virgil, demanded a response, not just an explanation. Commentaries are like translations, constantly updating, while the original text sits quietly in its spot and is made to speak in tongues and reach audiences its author never knew, even knew existed. So, well, we will find out what Ron Hertzman means by Dante without footnotes, but I would hazard a guess that he doesn't mean to leave Dante alone without comment on the shelf or to speak alone in his own idiom all by himself, like Virgil, whom Dante strikingly describes as hoarse from a long silence. I think tonight Ron Hertzman will be our commentator, our mediator, our access, our invitation to hear what Dante has to say directly to our hearts. So um, there's 18 pages of CV, um, but I will just uh, say a few things. Uh, Ronald B. Hertzman is a New Yorker, and uh, he got his BA at Manhattan College. He went on to do his MA and PhD at the University of Delaware. He has taught at the State University of New York uh, College at Geneseo since 1969. I believe it was his first job, um, a faithful uh, uh, professor, uh, his first job. Uh, but he's also been a fellow at the Center for Medieval Studies at Fordham, a guest teacher at St. John's College in Santa Fe, New Mexico, a prof professorial lecturer in interdisciplinary studies at Georgetown, and adjunct professor of literature at Attica Correctional Facility. Together with William R. Cook, he has produced three editions of an Oxford University Press 
volume entitled The Medieval Worldview, 1983, I think is the first one, 2004, 2012. And with the same collaborator, he has done the teaching company Great Courses Lectures on the Comedy, which I guess are available for purchase. Um, but um, I knew Ron Hertzman first through a series of really insightful articles on Dante. The one I continue to reread every year and assign to my classes is on cannibalism and communion in Inferno 33, that um, it's from Dante studies in 1980. More recently, of great interest has been Dante and the frescoes at Santi Quattro Coronati in Speculum in 2012 uh, with William Stephanie, and there are many, many more. And I would note that many of his undertakings have been collaborations. Um, a big one was National Endowment for the Humanities Summer Seminars for School Teachers in Siena and Assisi, Italy, on the Divine Comedy, on which, uh, which he first directed and then co-directed for over 15 years with William Stephanie, so uh, uh, teaching uh, high school teachers to teach Dante. He was the first recipient of the SUNY Geneseo Faculty Career Achievement Award in August 2017 in addition to a number of other scholarly um, teaching awards. Um, uh, but a place where Ron Hertzman's CV looks really different from other people's CVs is in Selected Professional Service, where I extracted this. Lectures to church adult edu education programs, to high schools and to other groups on Plato, Dante, Shakespeare, Chaucer, Francis of Assisi, and other religions, medieval and Renaissance subjects, most recently Dante, C.S. Lewis School, Bratislava, Chaucer at Saratoga, California High School, Dante at Branham, California High School, Brooklyn Friends School, Geneseo Central School, Webster High School, the John Cooper School, the Waterford School, the Montclair Kimberly Academy, Regis High School, Scotts Valley, California High School, and today he just taught uh, again at Regis High School his first class uh, for their trimester that's just starting. He is currently director uh, for the Dante Society of America, of which I'm vice president. He is the director um, of education and outreach for uh, the Dante Society of America for a five-year term beginning in 2015, a post that, like the SUNY Geneseo Faculty Career Achievement Award, was invented for him. Um, so with no further ado, I introduce uh, Ronald Hertzman. Please join me in welcoming him. Um, thank you, Allison. Um, uh, one of the reasons why I'm very happy to be here, of course, is that NYU has been a kind of uh, mecca for dentists through the years. Uh, Allison, of course, being one of the most distinguished. And um, if I were to say, read some footnotes, the one I would have you read are the footnotes that she wrote for the uh, edition of the Commedia that I'm currently using, the one that was translated by Stanley Lombardo. Uh, those are the best. Uh, footnotes and parodies of that I know of anyhow. Uh, one other thing that I have to say and that I'm extraordinarily happy to be here because uh, when my daughter went to NYU in the 90s for two years her work-study job was here at the CASA and I'm uh, sort of coming back many many years later um, proud that my first acquaintance with the place was when she was an undergraduate. Um, Okay, so to sort of continue with what Allison said, I'm going to start with a bit of a disclaimer, uh, just in case there are some members of the Dante Thought Police here. Uh, for the record, I am not anti-footnote. Um, <clears throat> they are, of course, among other things, a shorthand way uh, that Dante fanatics talk to each other uh, in the scholarly pieces that we write. And when we write articles on Dante, they are accompanied by a footnote or two or a hundred uh, many of them document our sources, which is kind of a good thing to do, but others are sort of mini insights, right? I mean, what could be more fun than describing an intricate little discovery slightly to the main argument, slightly to the right of the main argument, which will be of interest or use to perhaps two or three other people on the planet, <laughs> max. Um, the purpose, I guess, of this talk is at least in part to say that fun though it is to do business this way, it's maybe not the only way. And again, to piggyback on what Allison said, if you open up any edition of the Commedia, it is always accompanied by notes, by commentary, and as Allison said, this was true right from the beginning. 
So um, I use this example. This is a manuscript from 1345. And the reason I put this one up is because it happens to be a couple blocks up the road uh, at the Morgan. So uh, if you know, any of you want to go and sort of demand that you take a look at it, there it is. But you get some idea of the import of commentary by seeing the text of the Commedia in the beginning and all those wonderful uh, gloss notes on the side. So here we have this tradition uh, that's really, as Allison said, sort of built into the text and helped to explain things that were not apparent to the original audience, let alone to those of us who are coming at it a remove of some 700 years. So um, then and now they're useful, they're necessary, as long as you know uh, that they make really good servants but very poor masters. Uh, to put it another way, I think that what I'm getting at here is that they often have the consequence of making the poem seem a little bit too forbidding. Okay, I want to suggest, I guess, in this talk that we need not be intimidated by the tradition. So I want to start with a story that I often tell about why Dante has uh, turned into such an obsession for me. I um, had a student once who walked into my office after halfway through the Dante course. He was a poli-sci major, had intentions of going to law school, and he looks at me with great seriousness. He says, Dante's the smartest guy I ever met. I'm going to spend the rest of my life doing this. And by golly, he went off and got a PhD in medieval studies. A little bit earlier, mentioned I was teaching in Attica there in the maximum security prison uh, upstate. And at the end of the course, we're taking a final exam, uh, kind of an interesting place. 30% of the people there have taken a life. 70% are there for a violent crime. We're doing the final exam. One of the inmates gets up. He's over by the water fountain. He looks up at me and he says, when I read this poem, it's like I'm out of here. You're not going to get many teaching moments like that, let me tell you, okay? And so what I like to say is that Dante is the combination of head and heart. Uh, he's the smartest guy I ever met. When I read this stuff, I'm out of here. So that's what kind of um, hooked me on Dante, I guess. And uh, the rest of my um, talk today could be seen as a, pardon the expression, footnote uh, to that insight. Um, okay, we have the... Uh, the next and final. This is a quote from Paradiso. I'm quoting the Stanley Lombardo uh, translation because, of course, that's where the good notes are. Um, and it's early on in Paradise, the third part of the Divine Comedy. Uh, Beatrice, Dante's muse and guide, is giving him and us a pretty powerful lesson in interpretation. She says to Dante, your human faculties must be so addressed since they can only grasp through sense perception, what they then make fit for intellection. This is why scripture comes down to your level, condescende is the word that's used in Italian, when it attributes hands and feet to God while intending to convey another meaning. And why Holy Church portrays for you Gabriel and Michael with faces of men and that other angel who healed old Tobit. Okay, the takeaway, duh, God doesn't have hands and feet. Angels don't have human faces. One's got to go from a representation, a picture given to the senses, to a truth that the representation points toward. Beatrice uses, for, exam for her example, stories from the Bible. Biblical readers in the Middle Ages would be astonished, by the way, at modern fundamentalist readings of the Bible, thinking them to be both naive and incoherent. Um, Beatrice's lesson in interpretation should also be taken as kind of crucial to a reading of the text that contains it, that is to say, the to the reading of the Divine Comedy itself. This is one of the many outrageous manifestations of a claim that Dante makes, namely, that his own poem is best to be seen as a kind of imitation of the Bible, or to put it even more outrageously, as a continuation of the Bible into the present of Dante's time. This would be true from Dante's point of view, 
with respect to the most fundamental claim that the Bible makes, namely that it's about the interaction of the human and the divine, the finite and the infinite. Dante is ultimately concerned with nothing less in the Commedia. How can they interact? How can finite creatures talk about the infinite? Dante, at any rate, believed that that's what the poem was all about. Whenever I give a lecture about Dante to a general audience, parents, book groups, church groups, and so on, the question I'm frequently asked is some variation of the following. Did Dante believe all this stuff was true? And the answer I invariably give is, of course he did. That's when it gets interesting. Folks who ask that question are invariably asking whether Dante truly believes that what the poem describes is what the afterlife really looks like, and that Dante, even better, knows who's really there, um, that he has actually figured out uh, by some wondrous combination of divine inspiration and street smarts mm, who is saved and who is damned. It's figured out that hell really is divided into nine circles and subdivided within these circles with such great intricacy. He's figured out that Purgatorio really is a mountain with seven, seven terraces. And he has figured out that the union uh, with the ineffable, which we call by the name of heaven, is reached by taking a trip through a now outmoded Earth-centered cosmos. Now, Dante did not believe any of this. Dante nevertheless believed that his poem was true because the poem itself like the biblical hands and feet that Beatrice talks about, is something that points beyond itself to something more real than its surface level. But it's a perfectly legitimate question to ask, perhaps even a crucial one, because the afterlife that Dante imagines is so real, so impressively detailed, and so intricately constructed that while we are immersed in it, we can't help but think that A, Dante really did believe it was real, and B, he wants us to as well. And for many readers, while we're inside the poem, taking the journey along with Dante, it is real. And it is this kind of reality which makes the poem so fascinating. So, what is the poem? It's a three-part journey in which the protagonist pilgrim Dante visits the three parts of the Christian afterlife, Purgatorio, Inferno, Purgatorio, Paradiso, Hell, purgatory heaven. To get a handle on it, we could profitably say a journey from ignorance to knowledge. The pilgrim protagonist starts in a dark wood of confusion and disorientation, ends up seeing God face to face. It's a guided journey. For roughly the first two thirds of that journey, throughout the inferno and all but the last part of the purgatorio, Dante's guide is the Roman poet Virgil, whose epic poem, the Aeneid, is likewise a journey, one that is at the same time an imagined account of the founding of Rome and a comprehensive account of Roman ideals and Roman greatness, an account perhaps also subverted by an awareness of the price exacted by those ideals and that greatness. Toward the end of Purgatory, Virgil passes the baton to his second guide, Beatrice, the woman who was idealized and memorialized in Dante's early love poetry and who died young after she takes over from Virgil at the end of Purgatory, she remains his guide for most of Paradiso and serves among other roles as the most important theologian in the poem. At the very end of the poem, in the very last cantos of Paradiso, she gives way to a 12th century monk and mystic named Bernard of Clairvaux who guides the pilgrim to the ineffable vision of God. So here are some of my helpful ground rules uh, for reading the poem. Number one, a trip to the afterlife is a big deal. <laughs> it makes for an exciting story. And it's useful to remind ourselves that this, poem, that this trip is not an adventure, an invention of Dante. And even though Dante is himself a committed Christian, his appropriation of this tradition at least throughout the Inferno, is from classical sources rather than biblical, more pagan than Christian. The underworld can be found relatively briefly in Homer's Odyssey, in much expanded form in Virgil's Aeneid, and Dante expands the canvas even further to make the afterlife the space 
for his entire poem. So, Dante is claiming the tradition of epic poetry for himself, which is to say he's claiming for his poem the same kind of foundational importance that Homer has for Greek culture that Virgil has for Rome. But in one extremely daring way, he's also redirecting, or if you prefer, subverting the trip to the underworld and the entire tradition of classical epic poetry. In the Iliad and the Odyssey, Homer writes about Hector and Achilles and Odysseus. In the Aeneid, Virgil writes about Aeneas and Dido. In the comedy, Dante writes about Dante. <laughs> the protagonist of Dante's comedy is Dante. So he's combining the tradition of the epic with a tradition that I think is specifically Christian, the idea of a spiritual autobiography. Number two, Dante's journey takes place at a very precise time, the year 1300. We can do the math by looking at the very beginning of the poem. Midway through our journey of life, he famously begins, I found myself within a dark wood, for the straight way had been lost. Because, the poet says, our life rather than my life, we're meant to apply the biblical commonplace that a human life is typically three score years and ten, 70 years, and knowing that Dante was born in 1265, we come up with the year 1300. And of course, with the use of that plural pronoun, our, our life, we're also given an important clue to the fact that Dante wants his readers to apply what he has to say about his journey to our own lives as well. The poem has this dual focus, then, in which the specificity of Dante's life is also meant to prevent, present a kind of mirror for our own. Since Dante writes about himself in the year 1300, obviously follows, we need to know a little bit about what he was up to in that year. In short, he was both a political and a poetic success story. Someone seemingly at the top of his game, he was a prior, highest elective office in his hometown, the city-state of Florence. He was also a hot young gun poet, the best of a group of poets who succeeded in adapting the lyric love poetry that developed in courts in places like Sicily to the realities of urban life in an emerging mercantile economy. And then it all went south. In 1302, Dante was exiled, kicked out of Florence, ostensibly for taking bribes, but in reality for being on the wrong side, which is to say the losing side of a bitter ongoing political struggle. For the last 19 years of his life, Dante lived in exile. Sometime around 1308, maybe, he began work on the poem, and he completed it only a few months before his death in 1321. The genesis of the poem has a good deal to do with the fact that he realized that he was never going to return to Florence, and that his exile is both a defining moment in his life and a key to the poem itself. So a very fruitful angle from which to view the poem is to see it as a record of Dante's coming to terms with his exile, both with the hardships it will cause him and the larger perspective it can provide. The closer you are to the center of power, the farther you are from the heart of things. This is what he slowly learns and weaves into the fabric of his poem. Built in, then, to Dante's journey to the afterlife is this forward look towards a future exile, a strategy, of course, that's possible because he sets the poem in 1300, before the exile, and the monumental task of seeing it as something redemptive. Throughout his pilgrim journey, the exile will be presented to him through a series of predictions about his future and through a series of encounters with souls whose experience mirrors his own. Each of the three realms of Dante's afterlife, hell, purgatory, and heaven, each wildly different from the others, Dante the pilgrim interacts with and learns from the souls who are there. Now, if this journey is a learning experience for the pilgrim, it's in no small part because Dante the poet has imagined what I like to think of as the biggest classroom ever, which raises the obvious question. What do you need to be a member in good standing of Dante's afterlife? Well, guess what? You need to be dead. 
<laughs> and given the precise year of Dante's journey, you need to be dead by 1300. But other than that, the field is pretty wide open. You can be world-class famous like Plato or Aristotle. You can be very obscure like a character named Chaco who appears in Inferno 6. As far as anybody has been able to put together, he was something like a local Florentine glutton. Or you can be somewhere in between, somebody well enough known in Dante's time, but in our own time, maybe not so much. You can be from Dante's home, Florence, and not surprisingly, a great many of the inhabitants of the afterlife are. You can be from any other part of Italy. You can be from any place else in the world. You can be an exact contemporary of Dante's or somebody roughly contemporary. You are more likely to be dead by 1300 if you're not Dante's precise contemporary, but maybe from the generation previous. Um, one of the characters, for example, that we meet in the Inferno is a rogue turned Franciscan friar named Guido de Montefeltro, uh, one of my very favorite characters, uh, who dies in 1298. He barely makes the cut. <laughs> in Paradiso, on the other hand, Dante has a long conversation with Adam about the nature of language. You can't get any farther back than that. Okay? okay I have a question. What do Ron Herzman, that would be me, Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses S. Grant, Brendan Behan, Leroy Jones, Hunter S. Thompson, E.E. E. Cummings, Boss Tweed, Barbara Schaum, and Charlie Winans all have in common? And the answer is, at one time or another, <clears throat> we have all hung out at McSorley's old, ha old ale house, <laughs> um, the bar sort of around the corner over on East 7th Street. Uh, now, imagine showing up at McSorley's one fine night and finding all of those grand folks there together. The immortals, the famous, the not so famous, the totally obscure. Uh, for the record, by the way, one could use a footnote or two here. Anybody know who Barbara Schaum was? Aha, she was the first woman ever allowed in McSorley's when it was forced by law to go co-ed in 1970, okay? Uh, Charlie Winans was the teacher mentor who first took me there back in the heady and more civilized days when the legal drinking age in New York City was 18. Uh, I believe I was 16 at the time. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, that's what Dante does. And in addition, he does something else that is hugely daring in his choice of the afterlife, of the inhabitants of the afterlife. He does not differentiate between the real, the historical, and the fictional Let's go back to McSorley's for a minute. Imagine showing up and seeing, well, why not, Shakespeare at one end of the bar, lifting a Guinness, chatting it up with his buddies, having a fine time. The other end, in his customary suit of inky black, mostly downing a double vodka, all by himself. You notice Hamlet conspicuously not having a good time. <laughs> this is what Dante does throughout the poem. The real and the fictional meet and mingle with each other. The very real historical poet Virgil, for a conspicuous example, meets and talks with characters like Ulysses, who are his very own literary creations, each existing at the precise same level of reality in Dante's universe. How gutsy is that? First and most obvious thing to say about such a move is that it provides the poet with an even bigger gene pool a wider cast of characters to choose from. More interestingly, it's frequently the case that we know more about fictional characters than we do about real ones. Great artists can show us their characters from the inside, show us things that we could not possibly know about simply by observation or inference. Case in point, we know a lot more about Hamlet than we know about Shakespeare because Shakespeare gets us inside of Hamlet in a way that's simply not accessible when we're dealing with real people. When such characters show up in the comedy, they cannot help but bring something of their previous literary history, literary incarnation along with them, so that Dante is able to piggyback on what the reader might already know. The poem is a continuation of previous conversations, previous literary works. It starts the reader out 
at a very high level. So, Dante the poet creates an extraordinarily realistic picture of something that is manifestly, even outrageously, a fiction. What we cannot help but take to be real while we are inside the poem becomes a fiction that Dante believes has the power of pointing beyond itself, like the hands and the feet of God in biblical imagery, pointing toward something higher. Dante believed that this complex interplay suggests something that's crucial to understanding our everyday world as well. Though absolutely convincing on its own terms, the world we observe is like his poem. Dante would have us see it as a contingent partial reality and we're only able to see it as a contingent reality if we have the right tools. His poem is meant to provide one such tool, an interpretive key to allow us to move to something higher. Dante divides each of his three major divisions of the afterlife into 33 separate units called cantos, one extra one for Inferno to introduce the whole poem and to get us to 100, though each of the three parts of the afterlife are parallel constructions up close, they're quite different. Little toolkit to help read each part. In Inferno, hell is an inverted, inverted cone that ends at the center of the earth. The farther down the pilgrim travels, the more serious the sin he encounters. The souls in Inferno are all sinners, sinners who have conspicuously failed to repent. The dramatic encounters start with lust and with treachery so total that the governing image for understanding absolute evil is cannibalism, an image replayed at several moments in the final cantos of the Inferno. Once again, the architecture of hell as Dante conceives it turns out to be classical rather than Christian. It's three major subdivisions. Three categories of evil that the Inferno dramatizes are inversions of the classical version virtues, excuse me, first proposed by Plato and Aristotle. Moderation, courage, wisdom, their inversion in Dante becomes incontinence, subjecting reason to desire, violence, and finally fraud. The poet is very precise in his descriptions. The geography of hell presented in rigorous and imaginative detail is itself a clue to the nature of the sin. The poet creates a spiritual geography, the outer an important clue to the inner. Take, for example, the lustful sinners blown about by a wind that takes away their freedom of movement, an outward externalization, an outward manifestation of the internal storm of lust of what it means to subject reason to desire. Sinners in the inferno have this in common. They all have only one perspective, their own. They all see themselves as the center of the universe and as such have no frame of reference beyond themselves. Discerning all the brilliant ways in which Dante the poet instantiates this egotism is one of the delights of reading the Inferno. And as a corollary to this, the damned are all involved in one way or another in acts of self-exoneration. They're truly gifted at finding someone or something else to blame. The pilgrim, and this is one of the more interesting aspects of the learning process for Dante the Traveler, often buys into their presuppositions, showing that the sin he sees is also to be found at least as tendency in himself. Looked at this way, we can see that the punishments of hell are not so much ingenious tortures imposed from above by a pissed off God, but manifestations of each, what each sinner has become. Fundamentally, their punishment is to be themselves. As the old Roman adage goes, what is the most dangerous part of the sword? The hilt, because of what a sword does to one who wields it. Hell shows us the sinners all firmly gripping the hilt of their sins. And for that reason, the Inferno tells us about ourselves, what makes evil so destructive, and what makes it so attractive. Purgatorio. 
Purgatory is essentially a spiritual workout center where souls get in shape for the vision of God. Since it's the vestibule of heaven, all souls there are saved and get to see God finally. It's formed, as you know, a mountain with several, with seven terraces, each terrace associated with one of the root tendencies of evil, which go by the name of seven deadly sins. At the end of the climb, Dante and all the souls there reach the Garden of Eden and are pure and ready to ascend to heaven. When I taught Dante in Attica, it came as a surprise that for the inmates, purgatory was their favorite part of the poem. Why? Because they said it was about moral improvement. For these inmates, that was the key to the poem, and what gave the poem meaning to them, even in, maybe especially in, their incarceration, which was a fairly adequate representation of the way Dante describes hell. Um, so even though the souls are suffering, and therefore purgatory seems to resemble hell in many of its outward manifestations, the suffering is redemptive, purgative, and the souls there learn to do what is conspicuously lacking in hell, act within and as part of a community. They see themselves as part of something larger and get rid of their self-absorption. Souls in purgatory help each other, they help Dante and Virgil. It's the most endearing part of the comedy. In hell, souls get what they want. In purgatory, they get what they need. The most intense encounters in the Inferno tend to be, I would say, political in the largest sense, with Dante the Pilgrim going head to head with both secular and religious figures who wielded power in some way or other when they were alive. In the most dramatic part of the comedy, and for that reason, it is the most dramatic part, and for that reason, the most accessible. In Purgatory, the encounters are more gentle, less dramatic, and the cast of characters is very heavily weighted toward artists in the broadest sense, poets and painters and musicians in many sizes and shapes. In Paradise, the souls there want to engage in a lot of God talk. They tend to be theologians, philosophers, religious reformers, mystics. A lot of God talk, presented without the intense dramatic interplay of the inferno or the sweet gravity of the purgatorio, surely makes the Paradiso the canticle that is the most difficult to immediately befriend on first reading. Paradise not only presents a problem for the new reader, it also presented a kind of structural one for Dante, who needed a way to talk about a reality which is outside of time and space and which doesn't have existence in time and space. His solution was an ingenious way of attributing hands and feet, not only to God, but also to paradise itself. From the point of view of the pilgrim, the journey he takes is through the cosmos as it would have been seen from the earth, that is to say the so-called Ptolemaic universe, he moves from Earth to Moon, to Mercury, to Venus, to the Sun, to Mars, to Jupiter, to Saturn, and then beyond. In Dante's moralized cosmology, each of these stars, planets, symbolizes a virtue, and he meets souls on each of these planets who are representatives of that virtue. This is a striking example of condescension in its most literal sense. The souls Dante meets come down, condescend from their place, quote unquote, surrounding the throne of God where they really are to the planet, where they really are to the planet that allows them to meet Dante where he is. Though they are really surrounding the throne of God that is no place, they give time and space to Dante, which means that the souls in paradise are there only when Dante is there. Several times throughout the poem, the journey is described as a sea voyage. In some ways, the geography of Paradiso is, to borrow an image that Dante himself uses, like the wake of a ship that is continually disappearing as the ship moves forward. Or perhaps like a series of plays where Dante is the audience, and when he is finished and moves on to the next play, the stage is struck. The souls are only there when Dante is there.
One way of entering into the seemingly more abstract world of parody, so is by seeing how many of the issues, concerns, and themes of the poem get replayed in a more definitive way in the parody. So I had a friend who took rather outrageous liberties when doing his tax report and felt kind of offended if he didn't get audited. And when I called him on this, he just said, it's my first offer. Well, in some ways, it seems to me that the Inferno is Dante's first offer. Politics, just one example, if you take all of the cantos numbered six, politics in six provides a relatively easy example of this. In each of the three sections, each of the three canticles, political themes are replayed on a larger scale. Local Florentine politics in Inferno 6, politics of the entire Italian peninsula in Purgatory 6. In Paradiso 6, the Roman Empire is treated comprehensively both in its geographic breadth and historic depth. Thus, the narrative structure of the poem is not only continuous through a hundred cantos, it's also stacked with vertical readings of congruent cantos, opening up in ways that are both surprising and unsurprising. This is no less than another crucial way in which Dante takes his cue from the way the Bible was read in the Middle Ages, by the way. Old Testament stories from Hebrew scripture were read both in themselves and with reference to their completion in the New Testament, Christian scripture. So too with the poem itself and with those other texts, such as Virgil's Aeneid, that Dante co incorporates into the Commedia. Again, to take the relevant example, it's in Virgil's Aeneid, book six, that the history of Rome uh, is presented as a kind of prefiguration for Aeneas when he's in the underworld. Another way is to see Paradiso as a completion of what was taking place in Purgatory. Souls were learning to cooperate in Purgatory. Paradiso is a mosaic of cooperation where the interconnection between its parts is not only what the poet aims for, but also what it is fundamentally about. <coughs> Inferno is isolation. Purgatorio forms communities. Paradiso imagines communities. Back to footnotes. <coughs> Excuse me. Partly because of the footnotes, partly because of the intricate way in which the poem is constructed, there's a great temptation to look at the Divine Comedy as an elaborate puzzle. First time I read it in college, that's how I read it, and I gave myself points for those bits and pieces of it without what I was that I was able to figure out. The point of reading the poem is to figure out the puzzle, and the notes are not only a great help, they also encourage the reader to look at the poem that way. It took me a long time to figure out that the poem is not a puzzle, but a new, important, challenging, and most of all, exciting world to be experienced. Think of the Commedia as Hamilton, but with much cheaper ticket prices. Okay? Um, Ron Chernow, who wrote the biography of Hamilton, which galvanized Lin-Manuel Miranda, and became the basis for the musical, tells a great story. Hamilton the musical is about to debut. Chernow goes to his publisher and suggests they might want to print a few more copies of the book. The response, I'm sorry, you're saying it's a what? A hip hop musical with a cast of color playing the roles of dead white people, uh, many of whom were slaveholders. And Alexander Hamilton, who knows anything about Hamilton or for that matter, who cares about Hamilton? Come on, man, get real, give us a break. Well, of course, now Cherno is, as they say, laughing all the way to the bank. Uh, my point is that what was seen as massively unlikely by people concerned with the bottom line before the fact seems sort of inevitable after. In the same way, there's little about the Commedia that would have been deemed normal before it was written. Only after does it seem inevitable. And if Hamilton is all about redefining the musical, the closer one looks, the more one sees Miranda's attention to, allusions to, dependence on so many traditions, styles, musical, cultural, historical. He's doing something genuinely new and genuinely daring by combining so many strands of the old. 
and it's hard to know what is most extraordinary about Hamilton, its unity or its diversity. For Dante, too, it only seems inevitable after the fact. He redefined the epic in ways that we now take for granted, but were pretty daring, indeed radical at the time, writing in the vernacular rather than in Latin, which, among other things, signaled that Dante was writing for pretty much everyone, not simply an educated elite. He invented and extended what was essentially a new and quite demanding verse form. Imagine doing this thing with interlocking three-line rhyming, rhyming stanzas over 14,000 lines. Rhyme was not previously part of the epic tradition. And Dante is not exactly writing hip-hop, but the verbal dexterity of the commedia is a lot closer to it than one might first imagine, with outrageous punning, daring stylistic juxtapositions, and new words that Dante invents, and some really nifty, complex internal rhymes. And he did something new by intertwining the personal and the political, the big issues and a compelling personal conversion story brought, brought, brought together. And he dared to make the claim that poetry, as opposed to theology, as opposed to philosophy, is the surest avenue toward truth, and indeed, he challenged both theology and philosophy, the gatekeepers in the 14th century, as the only approved way. If um, any or all of these comparisons with Hamilton strike you as either too strained or too corny, they're nevertheless useful to the extent that they get you to think of the commedia as something vibrant and alive, exciting and daring, and almost, and most of all, something written for everybody. One of the things that was so cool about teaching Dante in prison is that the first time we walked in to do it, we realized that none of the people in the class had ever heard the name Dante before, hadn't the slightest idea who he was. And the reason they took the course was the dean just went and said, this is a cool course, you should take it, and they did. And imagine the thrill of telling people about this guy uh, and they did not come um, with any presuppositions. The poem did not come to them covered with the crust of canonicity. Okay? So I, I want to end with just one more story from my own teaching. Again, it has to do with Shakespeare and Hamlet. I was teaching uh, our humanities course. Hamlet's the last text that we do in the kind of Plato to Shakespeare version of it. And uh, this student came to my office. She was um, a person who learned English only as a teenager. She was actually a boat person from Vietnam. And uh, uh, so, you know, got to Geneseo, and her struggles with the English language uh, were there. But, you know, she's a remarkably diligent student. She came to my office with a great smile on her face. She said, I have read Hamlet three times, and I think I now understand 50% of it. And I <laughs> stared back at her, and I said, I've been teaching Hamlet for 35 years, and I think I'm up to 65%, okay? And so um, it seems to me that this puts us all in the same boat, rookies and scholars. The fact is that the most learned scholars I know, the ones that I footnote so readily, admit that they're still trying to catch up with Dante too. And that implies something very important. Experts and rookies are all in the same boat fellow passengers in the little bark that follows in the wake of Dante's big ship. Thank you. Ah, okay, here's what you need to know. Put five dentists in a room and you will get seven opinions. Um, I guess I would throw it back to you and say, depends what you want it for. For me, it's always very useful to have the dual language. It's always useful to have a set of notes that is not intimidating. It's always useful, from my point of view, to have something that stays reasonably close to the literal. But there are many dentists who would, who would disagree with all of those points. So um, 
Uh, I'm never, how do I want to say this? It's not like I found one translation and have stuck to that for my entire career. I've used with great profit, and I would still probably say this is maybe the go-to one, the Journaling and Martinez. Uh, again, I'm now using the Stanley Lombardo. The advantage there is that, again, facing page, compact, easy to carry along with you on the subway. And the notes to each of the three volumes are done by uh, different scholars, uh, Professor Cornish having done the Paradiso notes there. Uh, so I would say that one, Darling Martinez. Uh, there's an awful lot to be gained for. I sometimes get the feeling that the Hollander translation, the notes are so extensive that he's having a dialogue with other Dante scholars. It's a useful thing, but I don't think that that's what you want to kind of get you into the poem. In other words, what I'm trying to say is about the footnotes, one should be a minimalist, and, and that's not the translation that takes you in that direction. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's amazing also in terms of a matter of taste, uh, you know, some translations that I'm not so fond of, Dante's to my respect immensely love, and so um, uh, I, would, I would just sort of say, why not try a couple and see what, see what appeals to you. Anna, do you have a, Allison, do you have a thought on that one? Yes, exactly my thoughts, yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, I'm an art historian, and, and Dante has inspired artists for the last 700 years. So uh, my question is a rather simple one. When was the first illustrated edition? Was there any illustrated one? Oh, my. Uh, they, uh, illuminated the manuscripts are as old as Dante himself. And there's a wonderful tradition of uh, Dante illustration and illumination, a lot of it now readily available online to see what a tremendous, uh, uh, not only a tremendous artistic achievement they are, but what wonderful interpretive clues they provide uh, to the Commedia. Did uh, he ever endorse one or a, a see one and, and, and approve it or some other uh, sense of recognition of his own? <laughs> We, we have no record of that as far as I know. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, this is a bit of an experimental question. Um, so kind of if you speak about, you know, Paradiso and um, Purgatory as being kind of a place where community is kind of created and maintained, um, and kind of Inferno is kind of being a revolving around like a selfishness and a self-destruction. Yep. Um, I kind of had a very, very kind of immediate and maybe it's kind of misguided kind of connection to the concept of slave morality. Um. Do you have a comment on that? On kind of just the concept of does this, can we draw from kind of the understanding of community in Paradiso and um, Purgatory as kind of an upholding of this kind of, you know, slave yeah. morality, I, community, I think that society thing. The way that I would counter that is to suggest that there are, it, it's not as though in any way the individuality of the speakers is sort of submerged. Uh, that they are recognizably themselves. Some wonderful examples of it come in Paradiso. Uh, one of the things that's very interesting to me, for example, is that when uh, figures like Thomas Aquinas speak, uh, they are themselves. Uh, Dante has Thomas talk like Thomas would talk, um, mm -hmm. and so on through a wide uh, variety of altogether different sorts of folks that one, I did not in any way mean to imply that community was a disparagement of one's individuality, but that it is, re what do I want to say, personhood is realized through interconnections. Yeah. Uh, I, that Dante would have been a good Girardian, I think. Mm. I'm sorry. <laughs> Depends on the issue. Um, I, th I think that if you think about what would happen now, sort of play this little thought experiment with all of the stuff going on 
now uh, with um, the problem that the Catholic Church is having in its sort of hierarchical structure. Nobody has quite come out and said, I think that John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and Francis are all going to burn in hell. Dante takes popes and he puts them in hell. In fact, if you want to look at the, pro the profession that's most likely to, you know, wind you, it's being pope. Be careful what you want to be when you grow up, okay? There's only one, at a, one pope at a time, so the fact that so many of them in hell means, man, the odds are not good. Well, you know, from, from that point of view, uh, Dante is somebody who is shaking things up a little, to put it mildly. Uh, a lot of what he says about the right relationship uh, between the state and the church um, has its roots in all kinds of um, you know, theory that goes back before Dante, but at the same time would have been looked at in certain um, uh, circles as dangerously progressive. And there are lots of other things that Dante does that um, certainly seem to go against um, the, um, uh, the sort of business as usual attitude of a large part of the 14th century. One of the things that I find astonishing is the fact that modern popes have sort of a t kind of taken Dante to be their poster child in many ways. Um, Francis did, Benedict did, John Paul II did, and Paul VI did. Benedict XV actually wrote an encyclical in praise of Dante. I keep saying, haven't you guys read the poem? Okay. Uh, it, <laughs> he was, like all prophets, um, somebody who was in some ways quite fearless and was really uh, doing his job of um, comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable. I mean, they, they, I, that's the way that I would sort of take a look at, you know, the progressive versus conservative. Um, and there, there's an awful lot of Dante where you have to spend a lot of time sort of saying, well, what is it that he's really saying here? And it may turn out to be orthodox in some larger sense, but I think that what Dante does is help us to expand the idea of what orthodoxy is. Um, and that's one way that I would look at that. Was his vision of the structure of hell and purgatory and the hierarchization of sin totally original, or was that based in, in the current well, theological it was, belief? Yeah. Um, it certainly was not original in any sense in the, in the fact that all the categories come from uh, simply you know, classical ideas of virtue and vice. Creating, the way, creating it the way he did um, an awful lot of the artistic depictions of hell in the time around Dante and preceding Dante were basically just simply, hey man, look at this, it's such an awful place, you wouldn't want to do these sorts of things because it's going to wind you up there. Uh, what Dante is doing is using all of those things to sort of talk about what the psychological roots of sin are, the destructiveness of it coming from within oneself rather than some kind of imposed punishment. So um, there's something... Uh, very, very original about the way that Dante brings that conception to life, but at the same time, he's using categories that are already there and are already well known and are already really uh, canonical in a way. Fred? Uh, what about Frederick II's Super Mundi? Yeah. He spoke of the Holy Roman Popes. Yeah. Well, wow, it, uh, as they say, it's complicated. Um, uh, the, 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 back here. The short version uh, is that um, 
uh, Frederick himself is in hell for good reasons, as far as Dante is concerned. But at the same time, what he wants is for emperors to be emperors, to assert themselves and to uh, take away from the papacy the idea that the, the papacy ought to have some kind of temporal dominion. I mean, I think that the fact that um, so much of what is going on in Inferno is really about the um, encroachment of the spiritual onto uh, the temporal and the way that the church has been corrupted uh, by greed that, um, you know, uh, that's, that's sort of where the focus is. And so he really wants the empire itself to have a much stronger role than it, than it does. Ah, uh, the Attica thing. Yeah, um, luckily, uh, my buddy Bill Cook and I were um, in charge of a, a, a grant through a subversive organization called the National Humanities Faculty, which was all about sort of bringing shock paratroops uh, into places that wanted a kind of a, uh, a humanities booster shot of some sort. And we were working with a neighbor institution, Genesee Community College, when we got there, they discovered that they had, uh, we discovered that they all talked about the best and most fun teaching that they did to be the program that they had, an associate's degree program at Attica. So after we were there for a while, we said to the dean, hey, we'd like to give this Attica thing a shot. We have this good um, humanities course at Geneseo. Can we teach that there? And he looked at us and he said, why? I have people who could do that. Why don't you guys do Dante? So it was essentially this enlightened dean. And then the next year, this is one of the great coups of all time, he said, hey, guess what? We have some extra money. Why don't you guys have a conference? So we actually had the first, and as far as I know, only Dante conference inside the walls of a maximum security prison, where we brought in uh, outside speakers. Uh, Rachel Jacob was one of them. Uh, and uh, it, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I have the mic here. Oh, please. Uh, a question I have been thinking about is ego and Dante's voyage through the ego and his ego. I wonder if you could comment on that. What's your thoughts on that? Hugely, hugely important to think about. Um, there are lots of different ways to parse it, but think about it like this. What happens if you are somebody like Dante, who not only is talented up the wazoo, but realizes it. <laughs> and then the ego that's involved in the kind of poem that he's writing. So you take that and you balance it with the fact that the poem itself is an act of contrition in a way, in that you see Dante actually in the process of confessing all of his sins and thinking about the process, what happens how can somebody with enormous talent use that talent without himself going astray, without himself, um, what, becoming Donald Trump, all right? Um, it's part of, it's built into the dynamic of the poem that that's an extraordinarily, um, that, that's an extraordinarily important part of the poem. And people come out on various sides of the issue about where they want to where they want to place Dante's ego in all of that. Uh, but again, hugely rich area, a hugely rich way to think about what's going on in the poem. Shen. Um, I think that the, the con duh, keep doing this <laughs> that the connection would be it's fairly obvious that you know God doesn't have hands and feet and so you have to go beyond what does that mean when you're reading Dante's poem uh, one way of answering it is that it means that it turns uh, you know mild-mannered people like myself into obsessive Dante fanatics trying to 
sort of think about things at deeper and deeper levels because that's what the poem invites you to do. So I would look at it as a kind of invitation to constantly be going in that direction and understanding that uh, you're never going to be quite satisfied with where you are at any given time. Uh, I, th I think that might be a helpful way of thinking about it. I, I, I'm no good at picking. Hi. Um, my question is, how, how was, I'm a Dante novice, how was the work received when it was first published and how, how soon before it was well known by everyone? Because even though it was written in the vernacular, I imagine there was plenty of people yeah. who couldn't read it all. Well, well, you have to remember that the way manuscript culture worked is that you did not necessarily need to own a copy to hear the copy being read. So that one manuscript means sort of many readers, uh, or many listeners, if you will. So a lot of it was part of a kind of, uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of evidence that, that people were singing verses from Dante uh, who had never themselves read it or maybe even were not literate. And at the same time, it obviously fell, had a, an audience within learned community. One of the things that's very interesting is that um, the manuscript of the Inferno came out before the other parts were written. It wasn't all published. It didn't all appear as one. So you sort of think of this as a kind of a, a, a long, involved serial novel, lots of interest in it sort of picking up. Uh, but it's, um, uh, it, it's interesting to sort of think about it in terms of Dante as popular fiction. And I know, you know, some, some scholarly friends of mine are very interested in that aspect of the poem. Um, um, Cornish. Professor Cornish gave a wonderful paper uh, at the Dante Society meeting a while ago where uh, she talked about the fact that Dante maybe even welcomed the fact that his work would be read in translation and would approve of it. I'm not misquoting you there, am I? Don't know. Do, do you know that one? The first being printed? Is it? 1478? I think. Yeah, there's incunable. So, yeah, the earliest printed books. Among the earliest printed books, there's that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask uh, I'm, a, I'm getting my PhD in Italian studies, and I'd love to teach Dante one day, even though that's not the area of my research. And I'm wondering, and I have like this anxiety about that. And I'm wondering, like, <laughs> because of how m much there's written on him and all yeah. of that. And so I'm wondering what advice you would have for young teachers. Uh, the advice I would have is the fact that I look back at the first time that I taught Dante and realized that I didn't have nearly enough knowledge to teach the poem, but I did it anyhow. And um, now, 50 years later, I'm not sure I have enough knowledge to teach the poem e either but I'm so hooked that I can't help myself. Uh, I would say that one of the things that's uh, important is that you will certainly find basic rule of teaching Dante, no matter how much time you have, whether it's a semester's worth, a year's worth, um, a seminar where you do one canto a month and meet for, you know, a, a hundred months, it's never enough time. And so what you wind up doing is picking and choosing in such a way that you find things that are representative. And you'll find that the issue is not how you're going to have enough to say about the poem. It just, it just doesn't work that way. <laughs> so if um, Dante is, if, if the, you, Homer and Virgil are sort of footnotes in Dante. Uh, where's Dante a footnote? I mean, what's the next step after this? Like, what, what would you say in terms of the next pieces of literature to read where, where you see, you know, P, you know, number one reference to Dante? You mean, f uh, I mean the sorts it's of things of like that you need, yeah, I mean, need so, to read for Dante? Or? No, no, but oh, okay. sort of where, where in, in subsequent literature, epic, would you recommend, hmm. after you read Dante, where will you see traces of yeah. Dante in later people? Um, that's a great question. Um, the way I would have answered it a couple years ago is that I don't admit to anything much having taken place of import after <laughs> the death of Dante. But I, 
I, I, I kind of have, have given up that one. Um, lots and lots of different places in uh, other traditions. I, you know, it's, it's, there's so many major figures who have been influenced in one way or another. But the question, you know, everything from uh, Matthew Pearl on, uh, on back through the people that Matthew Pearl writes about, uh, you know, all, all of the folks who are in um, uh, his, his books on both sides of the ocean, ocean. It's very interesting to sort of follow them and to see them as readers of Dante. Uh, so, you know, all over the place in, say, 19th century England, uh, all over the place with Blake, um, you know, big influence on American poets. But I, I honestly don't know too much beyond that. Why is Achilles in lust? <sighs> the short answer is because Dante read some other accounts from the ones that we're most familiar with. <laughs> okay, one, one more, is that uh, silly? What did Milton do with Dante? Uh, he read them very carefully and then, and then screwed it all up. No, just, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, uh, I, you better yeah. stop there. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs>